One of my colleagues, when I probably told him I would be giving a talk at the US Go Congress, said, how do you give a talk to a room full of people, all of whom know more about the topic than you do? Which, first of all, gee, thanks so much. It's a great way to think about it. But uh, I mean, really, it is true, uh, despite having played Go on and off for the majority of my life. I'm still pretty much just a terrible amateur. I've never made the kind of conscious effort necessary to make solid, steady progress as a player. And and also, I'm not really an expert scholar on the history of Go or anything like that. I can't give you a specialist's insight into the details of how it evolved or grew or spread. I am a game designer and a game design teacher. That's what I do. And I'm an amateur Go player who loves the game, who finds deep meaning and beauty in it. And so that is what I can offer, my perspective on this game that we love, and in particular, how it relates to the modern world, to the other kinds of games that are being made and played in the 21st century, games that are absorbing billions of hours of people's time, that are carving out new dimensions of human creativity and beginning to claim our attention as a serious and important domain of contemporary culture. I am, of course, talking about Kim Kardashian Hollywood. Um, no, but actually I am talking about video games. Uh, video games have totally changed how we think about games, about what they are, how they fit into our lives, how they operate as an industry, as expression, what their purpose is, what kind of ideas and themes they explore and communicate. Now, video games are a global phenomenon, and that's one of the things that's great about them. But let's face it, they were invented here in America, like movies, poker, hip hop, and we can't claim to own these things, they belong to the world now, but we can proudly claim to have invented them. Go was invented in China, perfected in Japan, and is now arguably being played at its highest level in Korea. But here at the American Go Congress, we can ask, what is our role? How do we fit into the history and future of this game, this game that might be the most beautiful game ever created? How can we contribute to the shared project of developing Go, keeping it healthy, helping it grow, teaching it to the next generation? So that's what I mean by Go in the new world. What does it mean to play Go now? And what does it mean to play Go in America? This question highlights one of the most interesting and unusual things about games in general, and Go in particular. Because humans have always had games. Games have always been an important part of human culture. There have always been people like us, people who love games, who are drawn to them, to play them, think about them, understand them, and make them. But it's only been in the last century or so that we've thought about games as designed culture with specific creators, as opposed to just a kind of shared folk culture. And it's only really in the last few decades, since the advent of video games, that we've thought about games as a kind of aesthetic form. Something like music, or theater, or dance, I think part of this shift of perspective is that video games bring something genuinely new by blending aspects of other traditional media, art, animation, sound, storytelling. Video games highlight the aesthetic qualities of game experiences, those aspects that allow them to be beautiful, moving, expressive, rich, complex, meaningful experiences. So part of this new awareness of games as aesthetic form is due to these new qualities that video games introduce into the mix. But there's another way in which video games simply call attention to aesthetic qualities that were always already present in games. And this seems especially obvious in the case of Go. We know, for example, that in Imperial China, in the Tang Dynasty, if not earlier, Go was considered one of the four arts of the Chinese scholar gentleman, along with the musical instrument Gu Qin, with, along with calligraphy and also painting. We can also see this aesthetic quality when we consider the experience of playing Go, the special way it is set apart from ordinary life, the way it creates a stylized, ritualized encounter with another person, the way it bears traces of the sacred and the magical without itself being strictly religious. The point is, Go is beautiful. It does have the ability to move us. There are deep ideas expressed through it. It is meaningful in rich, complex ways, in ways that can be hard to see and hard to put in words because they aren't on the surface. These are the qualities that we truly value about Go. All of these qualities are, are, are a powerful demonstration of the aesthetic nature that is shared by all games, whether or not they have art, and animation, and sound, and storytelling. The aesthetic nature of games as interactive systems ritualized interactions guided and structured by rules, 
complex systems of thought and action that we explore together. And when we think about Go in this way, we get a glimpse of something remarkable. Because here is a beautiful work of human culture that is both tremendously ancient and vibrantly alive. Is there any other form of culture that extends through time in such a way? I mean, sure, we have Shakespeare, centuries old, and we still love Shakespeare. We still value him. We still celebrate him. His work is still influential. But there's a distance there. We appreciate Shakespeare across history. There are universal, transcendent qualities to Shakespeare that speak to us now. But there's a lot about Shakespeare that is of its era, that we need to study within its historical context. And part of what we appreciate about Shakespeare is exactly this quality of being of its time while reaching out and speaking to us in our contemporary lives. It establishes a connection to this earlier period and creates a sense of continuity. And I think this is true of Michelangelo's David, of the Colosseum, of the Iliad and the Odyssey, even of something as recent as a Picasso painting. But Go doesn't feel this way. There's no question of its age. When you step into Go, you feel the ancient quality, like stepping into an old growth forest or climbing the well-worn steps of an ancient city. But this is not a tourist site. This is a thriving, active city with people who live there, people chatting, playing, fighting, flirting, cooking and eating, raising families. There's no sense of peering at something across the mists of time and trying to find a connection. When we play Go, we experience the same kind of beauty and meaning in the same way as the poet Xiao Yong, who 1,000 years ago described the following scene. In a quiet courtyard in the spring, with evening's light filtering through the leaves, guests relax on the veranda and watch as two compete at Wei Qi. Each calls into themselves the divine and the infernal, sculpting mountains and rivers into their world. We're not used to this sense of time. We're used to thinking about works of culture that last for a week or a season or a year or two years, maybe even two decades, but then they disappear or they get preserved in a museum. But this, this is the long now. This is a whole different scale for thinking about works of culture. For example, in, in terms of thinking about this kind of long-term, slow-burn culture, my own personal relationship to Go is completely intertwined with my relationship to my son, James. That's him here. Uh, he's, I think, about to punish me for an especially weak play. Um, James and I, we both love games, and there are lots of games that we've played together. He sat on my lap while I played Myst. He learned to read by playing Magic the Gathering. We played chess. We played Donkey Kong Country. In fact, uh, for a short time, we were actually co-editors of a small critical journal about Donkey Kong Country called The Monkey Boys, which many of you may have heard of. No? Anyone? No? Okay, well... Suffice to say, we played a lot of games together. But when James was 12 or 13, we started playing Go. And there's something about Go, about how fine-grained it is, how finely calibrated to skill, and how simply and elegantly the handicap system allows you to track and measure relative ability. And so our games progressed over several years, and James got better and better as he got more serious, started studying in earnest, learning not just how to play Go, but what it took to really get good at something. While I remained a casual plunker, unwilling to invest the time and effort to really work on my game, and so we had this beautiful series of games, which were all about, on the one side, a young hotshot with this new sharp mental equipment, much better raw processing power, this desire to win, actively working on his game by seeking out the best players he could get games against online. And on the other side, this tired middle-aged man who had read lots of Ishii press books 20 years earlier. I mean, I, I couldn't compete against the tactical firepower of this whippersnapper, but I had that old man wisdom, you know? I had board sense. I had intuition. I knew the proverbs. I had a feel for shape. I could speak the secret language of the stones, and they told me where they wanted to go, that kind of thing. I, um, I probably don't need to tell you how the story turns out, he went from taking nine stones against me to taking eight and then seven and so on, the inevitable countdown to blast off, and then he eventually just took black, and then he took black and beat me. I don't think there's any other game that I will ever play that can do that, and no book or movie or piece of music 
when I think about all the complicated emotions and contradictory meanings of that moment, what it means to have a child and watch them grow up, what it means to feel the flow of time pass through your fingers, stone after stone, the intense pain felt by the male ego to be outplayed by a child, and the intense pride of a parent whose child is able to make their own way in the world, to climb ahead and look back and say, I'll show you the way forward. That's the day I learned that Darwin was right, that evolution is real, that we're not just getting louder and faster, we're getting smarter and wiser. That's the kind of thing that games can do when they last for thousands of years, when they're passed down from generation to generation. And so the question of Go in the new world is also a question about games in general, about how we should think about our relationship to the kind of culture that is very ancient and also very alive. Should we approach it with reverence, respect, awe, obeisance, or should we be thinking of ways to adapt, mutate, evolve, and reinvent it to make it relevant to our contemporary lives, to keep it thriving and growing? Go is older than the Colosseum, but it's as alive as Gangnam Style. I mean, maybe even more alive, because let's face it, Gangnam Style is pretty 2012 at this point. But Go is as alive as Tetris, Words with Friends, Threes, Flappy Bird, Kim Kardashian Hollywood, it has to fight for a place on my phone, fight for my attention, fight for a spot in the app store. And part of me wants to say, forget that fight. We're above it. And I think that's true to some degree. Part of what makes Go great is that it was here long before the app store existed. And it will be here long after the app store is gone. There's a part of Go that is immune to the noisy clamor of our time, the petty squabbles, the shallow trends and fickle fashions of seasonal culture. But, but, part of me wants to fight that fight. Not because I think Go is in danger of disappearing, but because there are aspects of Go that do speak to the present, that make it incredibly relevant to this moment, to us, now. There is a potential here for Go to reflect and express the unique qualities of our time as living culture. And it can't do that by remaining this sacred, aloof thing. And so partly, this talk is about fighting that fight and winning it. So what are the qualities of Go that make it relevant in the contemporary world? Oh, for me, first of all, there is what Go has to tell us about game design. At the NYU Game Center, we have a class called Games 101, which is sort of an art history style survey course about the whole history of games from ancient times to the present. And one of the first games that we teach is Go. And we teach it not just because it's historically important, but because it's a wonderful demonstration of some key concepts that are relevant to all games. To begin with, elegance. When you're designing games, whether they're board games or video games, you quickly learn that every rule that you add has a cost in the sense that it's an additional requirement for the player to learn and remember and apply and understand. There's a kind of administrative overhead that you're charging the player. Designers are often looking for ways to reduce that overhead while still having a deep, interesting system. Go, in addition to being abstract, is incredibly minimalist and at the same time incredibly deep. It's the ultimate example of this principle that game designers call elegance. This is one of the reasons that Go has a kind of sacred status among game designers, because of how it shows how game design can often be about not adding ingredients, but searching for the perfect combination of ingredients, the magic ratio of things that will make the game come to life. Closely related to elegance is the idea of emergence. What is the perfect combination of ingredients? What are we searching for? How do we recognize it? Well, emergence is the kind of hand-wavy term that we use to describe the property of a system that has simple, knowable rules, but when those rules are put in motion, they generate interesting, complex, unpredictable patterns. In some ways, emergence is the magic power that drives all games. How do we get from a handful of ingredients, simple deterministic rules, inert materials, to a living system that can entrance and fascinate and delight us and absorb our attention? It's because sometimes those ingredients fit together in a way that creates interesting patterns, like a magic engine. Go is the perfect example of this. 
I mean, it's not just a coincidence that John Conway used ghost stones to explore the concept of cellular automata and invent the ultimate example of emergence, Conway's game of life. Go itself is something like a cellular automata. It's just the right rule set to generate thousands of years of fascinating patterns. And by the way, emergence as a concept is incredibly relevant to a lot of the questions that we're especially interested in now in the modern world. Questions about consciousness, artificial intelligence. How can we get from uh, rules of physics and start there and end up with all of the strange and mysterious properties of the mind? Questions of cosmology. Where did the universe come from? Where is it going? Practical questions about economics and politics, about the behavior of complex systems, the limits of our ability to predict and control them, the likelihood of unintended consequences. In many ways, the discipline of game design is all about tinkering with rules and materials, searching for these magic combinations that are capable of erupting into volcanoes of interesting behavior. Even in games where it's not obvious, take a game like Flappy Bird, like Go, Flappy Bird is incredibly simple. It's a minimalist game. Now, Flappy Bird isn't deep in the way that Go is. It's not a strategy game that unfolds over time. It's a straightforward skill test, a game of pure execution. But clearly, something is going on here. There must be some explanation for the game's ability to draw us in and hold our attention. The interesting thing about Flappy Bird is that it's simple. It only has a few ingredients. There are a lot of different ways you could combine those ingredients. The size and distance of the gates, the height that Flappy pops up when you tap, the rate of his fall, the specific angle and rotation. Now, I have a lot of game designer friends who kind of went crazy on Flappy Bird a little bit, They're deconstructing it, analyzing those settings. The upshot is basically that there's something special about this particular combination that Dong Win put into Flappy Bird that generates this amazing rhythmic system. It dovetails with our perceptual apparatus in just the perfect way to become this hypnotic, entrancing experience. And game design often takes the form of a search through the space of possible combinations of ingredients and settings, intuition, iteration, trial and error, sweeping our dowsing rods back and forth, waiting for them to vibrate and let us know that we've hit on something, some corner of the universe that generates complex, interesting stuff. So in a world flooded with games, with more people playing games than ever before, and games becoming more prominent, one of the things we should be looking for is ways to evolve and expand the critical literacy of people playing games. Because culture evolves in concert with the appetites and capacities of a literate audience. And Go is one of the most powerful demonstrations of these key concepts of game aesthetics, elegance, and emergence. Now, obviously, there are many other styles and types of game aesthetics. You have the aesthetics of Baroque complexity in a game like Pokemon or, and immersive simulations. But elegance and emergence are so powerful and important and at the same time so subtle and hard to see that it's incredibly valuable to have this deep demonstration of them in Go. Go is a much better demonstration of these principles than chess, for example. And one of the questions we should ask ourselves when considering how to expand and elevate Go is, what's up with chess? What is chess doing that we're not? And I think the simple answer is partly just tradition and familiarity. Chess has its roots in India, but then spread to Europe and became dominant there. And America inherited chess along with many other aspects of European culture. And then we get Bobby Fischer. And you know, once you get an American world champion, you kind of cement your status. At that point, we're permanently interested. But these things are not destiny. Cultural legacies are not immutable. They evolve and grow and change. And I think the time is right for Go to close the distance between ourselves and chess in the West, in America. Maybe we're in a similar situation to soccer, the global game that has been so slow to gain traction in the US. You can sort of see the parallels, right? American football is a game of highly specialized roles and discrete plays. Soccer is a game of potential and flow, and maybe it's just the afterglow of an amazing World Cup, but I think we can see soccer gaining inch by inch as Americans become more literate and more invested in it. So maybe that should give us some reason to feel optimistic. Literacy and investment, these are the keys to success, an ability to read the game and a reason to care about it. If I were going to give one piece of advice for elevating the status of Go in the new world, it would be this, that we should do a better job embracing and celebrating Go's status as the deepest, 
most challenging competitive game in the world. Sometimes I think that message gets diluted when we talk about Go as a lifestyle, when we focus on its ancient status, when we fetishize its mysterious and exotic qualities. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to overemphasize the mystical, quote-unquote, Eastern properties of Go, its subtleties, its balanced interplay of forces, light and dark, yin and yang, even the beautiful traditional materials of wood and stone. Sure, that stuff is in there, it's important, but a lot of the way we talk about Go I don't know, maybe we think we're being respectful of its origins, but I think there's a danger there that we are at least partly exoticizing it. What would happen if we stopped highlighting that stuff and instead presented Go as what it is? The world's greatest game, universally human, the greatest living strategy game, deeper than chess, harder than poker, the ultimate expression of competitive gameplay. Because here's the thing, we are currently living in a golden age of competitive games. Over the past 10 years, we've seen an incredible explosion of growth in the field of competitive gaming, generally referred to as esports. These are video games that are played at an extremely high level by talented, dedicated players, supported by huge communities of casual players, spectators, and fans. At the highest levels, there are professional players and teams, big sponsorship deals, live tournaments with huge prize pools. But it's important to recognize that the biggest games of all, League of Legends and Dota 2, evolved out of a scene that didn't start with any of that. Both of those games evolved out of the original Dota, Defense of the Ancients, which was a kind of folk game created by players making and modding their own maps, their own custom variations of the commercial video games StarCraft and WarCraft. And this custom homebrew game became more and more popular over the course of many, many years, until it eventually became the most popular online game in the world, without advertising and sponsorship and prizes. And you have to understand, Dota is incredibly hard, incredibly challenging, and incredibly competitive. This is a deep game that demands study, demands practice, and allows for an incredibly high level of competitive performance. The point is that there is an appetite for these qualities in games. And that's surprising and fantastic news. Sometimes it seems that whether it comes to games or movies or whatever, the only thing people want is to be coddled and amused and entertained by simplistic, repetitive, formulaic junk. But it's not true. Look at this vast community of people who are drawn to an experience that is about mastering a deep, complex, difficult to understand system, who want to enter into a competitive discipline that requires and rewards effort and patience and study. These are our people. Because all the games that make up esports, whether they are on the surface about controlling armies or shooting or fighting or magic spells, under the hood, they all share a common foundation. First of all, they are all primarily games of thinking, even when they involve fast reflexes and precise execution. But most of all, they all require and reward the same approach. Discipline, effort, patience, study. These are the kind of games that, like Go, do more than just entertain you or distract you. They encourage you to engage in the hard work of self-improvement, which means honestly confronting your weaknesses, understanding your mistakes, and trying to correct them. This is why you see high-level StarCraft players like Bertrand Grosbillier and high-level Magic the Gathering players like David Williams entering into the world of high-stakes poker and making millions of dollars. Because under the hood, all of these games require and reward the same skill set. Study, practice, analytical problem-solving, and let's face it, a healthy dose of obsession. This is the new world of competitive gaming, with big audiences, passionate communities, grand spectacles. And in my opinion, it's time for Go to claim its rightful place in this new world as the ultimate competitive game, the deepest, hardest, most competitive game of all. Now, I'm not saying Go should try to compete with these games, try to become as popular as them. Its status is way beyond that. Go doesn't need to compete with these games. Go will be around long after these games are gone. I have no doubt about that. I'm saying that Go should tap into the spirit of the times and embrace the energy and enthusiasm that people have for high-level, strategic, 
cerebral competitive games. I think we should make an effort to provide more opportunities for the best American players to compete and more incentives for them to succeed. It would be great to see tournaments with prize pools and sponsorship opportunities big enough to capture the attention of some bright teenager who dabbles in League of Legends and chess and poker and Hearthstone and is pretty good at Go but doesn't have much opportunity to play it, big enough to give him a reason to get serious about Go and maybe discover that he's our Bobby Fischer. I think we should make more of an effort to make sense of the competitive scene on a global level, to highlight and celebrate and explain the significance of the games that are played by the best players around the world. When I was doing some poking around in preparation for this talk a few weeks ago, I discovered that Lee Sidal, who is maybe, probably, the best Go player in the world, is playing a Jubangi against his arch rival, Gu Li. What's a Jubangi? Does this matter? Is it important? Does it mean anything? Is there something at stake here? Who knows? And I think that's a problem. Personally, I would be a lot more interested in the world of high-level Go if there was some structure that framed it for me, something that made it more than just a bunch of different tournaments and a bunch of different games played by a bunch of different pros. I would like there to be some kind of global ranking system, some kind of ceremonial event where I could follow the action and the drama and the story of the best players in the world duking it out for the top slots. And if the best players in the world are Korean and Chinese, so what? The best League of Legends players in the world are Korean. The best Dota 2 players are Chinese. The best Counter-Strike players are Swedish. That doesn't stop me getting excited for the championship series of these games. And it gets my competitive spirit fired up. Why are Americans so bad at video games? We invented them. By the way, the groundbreaking moment in esports was the competitive StarCraft scene in Korea. In the early 2000s, Korea adopted StarCraft as their national game. It became a spectacular phenomenon, as important in its own way as baseball is to us. There were a number of reasons for this, but one of them is that StarCraft is really just a complicated strategy board game. And Korea already had a tradition of supporting and celebrating and spectating a strategy board game. They already had a tradition of TV stations that broadcast professional gamers playing a deep strategy game. Baduk, go! So in some ways, the StarCraft scene was just an extension of the existing passion for competitive gaming in Korean culture. And in my opinion, Go has already played an important and underappreciated role in the development of esports and this new world of competitive gaming. When you establish a clear ranking and lavish attention and rewards on the top players, you give the people who are world-class an incentive to play the game at the highest possible level. And that gives people one rung down from that, an incentive to get serious and aspire to that top level. And it gives the players in the next tier down from that something to look up to and aspire to and learn from, and so on and so on, all the way down to the most casual players and the beginners who are just starting to learn. Valve, the company that makes Dota 2, understands this, which is why the Dota 2 World Championship has a prize pool of $10 million. And this is one of the things that makes Twitch TV one of the most interesting and important forces in contemporary game culture. Twitch is an enormously popular website where gamers stream live video of themselves playing games and commenting. Twitch broadcasts range from massive live tournaments watched by millions of simultaneous viewers to people who are streaming to one or two friends and includes everything in between. It's almost as if you combined ESPN with YouTube and threw in some ham radio for good measure. People stream all kinds of games on Twitch, from single-player games to competitive multiplayer games, but the competitive games are responsible for the majority of the traffic. People watch other people play competitive games for a number of different reasons. They want to see deep games played at a high level, but also they want to see drama. They want to see the struggle of players fighting their way through a high-stakes competitive landscape. And also because they want to gain insight into how the game should be played. They want help with their own learning process. You don't have to be the best to have a popular Twitch channel. You can do well by having a personality and commenting on your games in a way that helps people understand the game and encourages them to root for you. Literacy and investment. And having a moderately popular Twitch channel can be a source of decent income for players who aren't good enough to be pro, but are able to get some small-scale sponsorship and maybe a thousand or two fans who are willing to subscribe to their channel for a few bucks. 
I, I should mention this guy who goes by the name Chess Network, who streams on Twitch and on YouTube as well, was so brilliant at live commenting his own games. It's just this amazing experience to watch him play high-speed blitz chess and to hear him articulate his thought process live while playing. I mean, I don't even play chess. I don't particularly like chess, but I became addicted to watching this guy's videos because he's so good at articulating what's going on. Now, there are a handful of people who stream Go games on Twitch. There are a handful of places on the web where you can search for news and analysis of the international scene. But honestly, if you're a young person who is learning Go and you want to dive into the scene and get hype, you want to experience the drama and excitement of the best players in the world playing the game at the highest level, you're basically out of luck. It doesn't exist. If you want to follow the adventures of someone who's better than you as they play and learn and work on their game, it's very hard to find. I think there are positive developments in this direction. I'm excited to see things like the new North American Pro Certification System. Congratulations, by the way, to Kelvin Sun, who's the most recent certified pro. I'm excited to see the first year of City League play with support and live coverage from Pandanet. These things are great, and I hope we can continue to build on this momentum. Now, to some of you, this vision I'm sketching out, with a focus on competition, highlighting the best players, creating a more coherent competitive scene, giving players more prizes and status and sponsorships, both on a global and local level, amping up the stakes and the drama, this may sound a little vulgar, a little crass. You might think that the game should be appreciated for its intrinsic beauty, not for prizes and status and rewards. And maybe you're right. I don't know. But I think that maybe this is what American Go would look like. It would be a little noisier, a little flashier, a little more vulgar, a little less Tang Dynasty, and a little more NASCAR. And I understand that that might sound terrible to you. But remember, don't use thickness to make territory. We should not be doubling down on our status as a quiet, sophisticated, refined game. That's our foundation. That's our base. That's not in danger. We should be leaping out into new territory to lightly probe and attack. Who knows what could happen? And also, the enemy's key point is your key point. What if making Go a little more vulgar, a little uglier, a little more American could bring a new generation of Americans into the game? Wouldn't that also mean that we just made America a little more sophisticated, a little quieter, a little more beautiful? I think there's a version of American Go that is like American yoga, a little tackier, a little less spiritual, a little more athletic, a little more commercial, but still a good thing, a positive ingredient in our lives and a busy, thriving, vital corner of the cultural landscape. And I think we get there by recognizing that this is our time. There is a generation of young Americans growing up steeped in the culture of deep, challenging, cerebral, competitive games. And if we pay more attention to this generation, understand how and where and why they play, then we could contribute something big and valuable to the ongoing life of this game that we love. Thank you.